whoa, that choice I made to lean into that stress and embrace it and push through it made me feel so much better than I know I would have felt if I'd have pushed it off and had, you know, three chocolate chip cookies, right? Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Artie. Yeah, so we connected on X several months ago, and I've uh, I really enjoyed watching your posts and stuff like that and hearing a little bit about you. So before we get started, for people that might not know you and be familiar, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Again, m- my name is Jeffrey Banks. You can find me on X at Jeff Banks with one F. And I'm a dad. I'm a cybersecurity sales pro. And on X, I'm building a personal brand around my longevity habits, my longevity lifestyle. I call, I call my journey the Longevity Chronicles. I have a newsletter by the same name. And I got into this sort of by accident when I, I realized that as uh, a guy approaching middle age, I, my wife and I were having very young children. We started a family fairly late, and I understood that I was going to need to sustain myself for decades or longer than a lot of the guys I grew up with who had families when they were younger. And very systematically, habitually, patiently, I went down that road and transformed my whole life along the way. And I love to share that journey and that transformation with people who are coming up behind me because I really do feel like I've sort of like unlocked a door to living my best life and a journey into personal happiness that I can sustain for decades. And, you know, who wouldn't want to share that with people if they, if they had the key. And I I love writing about it every day. I love talking about it. And I've built a whole bunch of habits in my life very mindfully where I'm sort of pulling the levers of longevity every day and the results are really apparent. I love it. I, I'm really excited to explore the, the longevity thing because I, I'm 39. I'm, I'm in okay health, but you know, I, I'm, it's a lot harder to keep off weight and to keep up the energy that I used to. And, you know, I'm always looking to pick up a little tips for myself and, and I, I hope listeners benefit too. And I'm sure they will. For some perspective, can we put some numbers to it? So how old are you now? How old were you when you had your first child? So uh, I'm 50 now. I turned 50 back in December. And I had my first child at 39. He's going to be 11. um, He's going to be 11 on Monday, in fact. And where this transformation started for me was... It was almost exactly nine years ago. It was like nine years ago in September when my wife was entering the second trimester of pregnancy with our middle child who turned eight back in March. Um, I was, I was very overweight at that time. I had a, one of my oldest, closest friends had come into town in Boston where we were living at the time. We traveled around with our only child, my oldest son at that time. We traveled around the city. We went out to the river, the Charles River in the springtime, or I guess it was autumn. It's just absolutely gorgeous out there for people who've never been to Boston, the Esplanade and the Charles River. It's iconic for a native Bostonian like me. And we took some pictures out there and I looked at the pictures afterwards and was just aghast at how I looked. It didn't happen overnight. It was a long process of neglecting my health and nutrition habits that led me there. And so like a couple of days later, we went to, we went to a hospital to do some genetic testing to see if our, uh, you know, our unborn child was predisposed to any kind of genetic abnormality. It's something that's, um, not uncommon in pregnancy in, in, you know, in these days. And there was a scale in the hallway and I stepped on the scale and it, it was, it was like a nightmare. And that day when I stepped off the scale, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to change. I'm going to start today and just do it for as long as I have to, to get to where I want to be. And by the time our son was born about six and a half months later, I'd lost 60 pounds and was barely recognizable. 
So, and, and it, not only was it a transformation of my physical body, but it was also a transformation of my mental health, my career, the nature of my relationships with the people all around me. And these are all of these things put together are sort of like the pieces of a longevity puzzle. It's not one thing or another that makes it happen. It's a total interconnected system of different habits and outcomes. I feel like that lead me and push me in that direction. When you were, let's say 18, 19 years old, were you pretty thin at that time? Pretty athletic? So it's funny. I was, um, I was an, I was an athlete. I played soccer and I, in, in high school and college, I was a two sport varsity athlete, soccer and lacrosse. Soccer was really my game. And I played soccer semi-professionally after college too. And I, you know, things tended to come really easily to me. Yeah. I trained a lot and I practiced more than I trained physically, but I basically ate and drank and did whatever else, whatever I wanted and could sustain that. But right now, and you know, I'm coming off a of surgery, so I'm a little heavy right now. I'm actually 10 pounds lighter than I was when I played varsity soccer in college. And I, you know, I don't really need to bulk up. I don't feel that, but I do, you know, I exercise with weights eight or rather four times out of every 10 days. I've got this really, um, I think it's kind of unique, my, my workout regimen. But I do lift and I do resistance training, strength training. I do cardio. I do yoga every day. And what I find, it, like when I played soccer, I had to be bigger and stronger. And we were kids. We ate whatever. Like we didn't care. Yeah. But now, like I feel better when I'm carrying less on my frame. I have better mobility, better agility, and I can still cultivate the kind of strength that I need to play on the floor with my kids and lift the heavy suitcases and whatever else is practical that I need to do around the house to be a good provider. I can relate to a lot of that. I'm, I was never like a standout athlete or anything, but I've always been athletic. And when I was younger, it was like, I could not gain weight. I wanted to be like a bodybuilder when I was 18, 19. And I could put on like, I can get, uh, shredded pretty easy, but I could never put on like a bunch of weight and a bunch of muscle, which I'm kind of happy about now because that can, when you uh, let off of that, it can turn to fat pretty easily. But yeah, it, it's interesting how you, over time it just kind of, you, you let go of that. And sometimes the mentality around that doesn't catch up to where your physical body is when, when you're not able to keep that weight off. So I ate whatever I wanted at 18, 19. No belly from that. Now I can get a belly pretty easy from it. So where was it? Was it junk food? What was it that like started putting weight on for you? So um, where, where I really started putting weight on was in my 20s. I lived in Los Angeles and I worked in the movie business. And, you know, I, I you know, I, after I stopped playing soccer, I was probably 24 years old. I, you know, my physical fitness regimen really just went out the door. And if you look at a lot of former pro athletes and stuff, you see these guys, sometimes they blow up when their playing days are over because they don't see the need to train anymore. And it wasn't just food. A lot of it was alcohol too, you know, just mindlessness. I, I, you know, I, I've said the words mindful and mindless since, since we started. And um, it, it really was a kind of mindlessness yeah. where I just did what I wanted. It was kind of a hedonistic lifestyle. And in, when, in my twenties, it was even worse than it was in my late thirties and in my early forties. Like it was just, you know, I, I wasn't caring about that at all. I was paying attention to other kinds of things. The first real transformation that I had physically was when I turned 30 because I saw what I had done to myself and I said, I, I can't live like this. I don't want to. And so I lost, I lost a bunch of weight then, but. I, I was actually heavier when I was 30 than when I was 40. Hmm. So I, I lost a lot of weight, but was still like, was still pretty heavy when a lot of it had come off. And I was able to say, sustain that for about five years. When I met my wife, I was 35 when I met my wife. No, no, I was, I was 35 when I got married. But for the, for the first half of my 30s, I was sustaining a weight that my doctor told me, he would say things like, well, look, 
there's no medical reason why you need to lose weight. But according to our indices like BMI or whatever, you probably should think about losing some weight. And um, it, it wasn't until my wife was pregnant with our middle child where I just, you know, my brain sort of works this way where there's a, you know, you, you mentioned the word resilience when we were uh, talking the other day, like there's a thing that my brain does where it, I make a decision and then it's like, it's like I'm an unstoppable force hmm. for, for whatever reason I commit to it and I, it's unwavering. It can't be broken. And that's what I've done with my life. Do you ever have doubt or like not doubt personally, but do people ever doubt you or you're not going to do that? Does that add to it? Yeah, that that's been a um, <laughs> people doubting me has been a major source of motivation for me throughout my life. You know, I can remember I got cut from the first soccer team I tried out for when I was 11 years old. And, you know, I remember going back home and sitting at my kitchen table and looking at my parents like those guys made the wrong decision and I'm going to prove them wrong. And I did. So people doubting me is definitely uh, is definitely a powerful motivator for me, but I'm also not, I, I, I would say that I recognize that sometimes when people cast doubts, it's because of things that they know. And, you know, I've, I've been in conversations where um, people, you know, people have been like, well, 90% of people who try to do this fail. And I'll look at them like, well, I'm one of the 10% and I went out and failed. And, yeah. and that's okay. Like I, I'm okay with that. That just wasn't my thing for whatever reason. And you can have fun with that too. You know, somebody, somebody was saying the other day in a space on X, you know, 80% of people who write stuff on X are boring. And I was like, I, I must be one of the 80% that's boring. You know, who I'm I, like, I don't, I, you know. I don't think so highly of myself that I'm automatically like, well, that's not me. I'm not boring. Maybe I am. I don't care. And it's funny, Artie, because now I like, I kind of want to lean into the idea that this is actually really boring stuff. What makes me, what sets me up for the way I want to feel and the life I want to live and sustain for decades is it's not terribly exciting. It's habits that are applied consistently on a daily basis. And some people find that boring. Some people want to look and feel great and cultivate great relationships around them. And it's, it's, it's repeated actions, I think, that do those things. And maybe some people find that boring. Some, maybe, maybe people want to go out and get drunk at a club with their friends and party until three in the morning. Like That's exciting. And that's okay. But that's, that's not really for me anymore. Yeah, boring is in the mind of the observer, I guess, right? Because, yeah, I mean, boring is just relative, I think. I, it, it's, um, you know, what some people find boring, other people might really find fascinating and enjoyable. My aunt, who's 80, she does hand-painted furniture in Connecticut. And it's like this, you know, if you're into hand-painted furniture, it's awesome but it's like a super duper niche, right? And the people in her community love her for it. And she has customers and she has friends and community that revolve around this. And I can handle hand-painted furniture for about an hour, but it's, it's not my thing. And part of why, I, I think part of what enables me to experience joy on a daily and a moment to moment basis is my acceptance of that. And my allowance for other people to have things that they enjoy and find fascinating and exciting and, and honoring them for that and uplifting them and like appreciating those people and those things for what they are. I, I think when it comes to being perceived as boring, it also changes, changes uh, as you grow older. When I was in my 20s, what was exciting and fun was a lot different than what's exciting and fun now. I I would say a lot of things I would say are I would consider them boring when I was in my twenties, but now I get a lot of joy from it. Sitting down, finding time to sit down and read a book is extremely exciting for me. I, I really value when I can find time to read books. 
And I, I tried to every day, although I've broken the habit a lot lately, uh, keeping up on some other things. But I also feel like a kind of a boring person sometimes. But I'm here running a podcast, and I feel like I, I get interesting people to talk to. And I am curious, so I can pull out some things that I'm like, oh, okay, that could be interesting for people to listen to. But, you know, I've had people say they enjoy the podcast. So I feel like I'm doing something all right. And I feel like you are doing something very right. Like, I don't think your content is boring at all. I think you are, you're sharing something very personal to you, something that's helped you. And I think it's really exciting. I think it's uh, valuable. And it's something that a lot of people aren't always mindful of because it's you you kind of have taken the opposite of the path of least resistance and maybe it's become less resistant over time for you so I, I would love to dive into that because I'm I'm personally at the crossroads right now where it's like I've had some bad habits lately probably over the last few years with junk food and stuff like that it is comforting it's like it's easy it's easy to take out a bag of chips and eat some food um, and and indulge a bit. But I know it's not good for me long term. And this initial, you know, I've gone back and forth with it lately, like this initial like, okay, I'm going to get set, I'm going to drop sugar, I'm going to, I'm going to be consistent with going to the gym. It's difficult at first, but I'd imagine it gets very easy over time. I would love for you to dive into that a bit. Yeah. Um, what I find, Artie, is that habits perpetuate themselves for good or for bad. And I've, I, I've, you know, I, I meditate a lot a daily, right? I meditate for 10 minutes every day. And so over time, I've become more sensitive to how I'm actually phys physiologically feeling in the moments where I'm indulging or giving myself an easy reward, whether it's, you know, a, a mindless game on my phone or a bag of cookies or a pint of ice cream, whatever it is, like habits tend to perpetuate themselves. And so, you know, there is a measure of hard work involved in establishing the right habits and sticking to them. We were in a conversation the other day with Coach Jacob on X and, you know, this two hour space that you held where Coach Jacob was sort of like the featured guest, mm -hmm. that conversation, and I need to reach out to him because it really reframed something that I wasn't conscious of that now I've hit upon in a way that it's like this new level of awareness that I've developed. And what he talked about was how when you have a reward that's easy you tend to repeat that award, that reward. But the, the rewards that you gain easily, whether it's a bag of chips or a bag of cookies or a pint of ice cream, uh, ice cream is kind of my thing, um, or it's the, the mindless game that I love on my phone, Tune Blast, which can just completely derail my whole day. Those rewards are an illusion and they're not as valuable as the rewards that you have to work hard for. And I, I heard a conversation between Huberman and David Goggins months back where Huberman was talking neurobiologically about this aspect of the brain that when you do things that are hard, that you don't want to do and make that a habit, that actually, that's, that's a marker of longevity when you develop that habit. And so... What I what I what I realized in that conversation with Coach Jacob, and I practice it a lot myself without previously having been aware, is that the more you force yourself to do hard things that you don't necessarily want to do, the greater the rewards and the stronger you become. And so, whether it's the workouts that I do, I love working out, but every single day before I work out, I. I wonder to myself, can I do this? Am I going to be able to do what the, the challenge that I'm setting myself up for? And I feel the stress. Like I can feel the stress reaction in my arms, in my stomach, you know, and in my, in my heart rate. Right. And then I get into it and I focus and I, and I really bear down. And then when I'm done, I'm like, Oh man, this, this is great. 
And then 12 hours later, I feel the difference in my body. And I'm like, whoa, that choice I made to lean into that stress and embrace it and push through it made me feel so much better than I know I would have felt if I'd have pushed it off and had, you know, three chocolate chip cookies, right? Yeah. And it, I can apply that to almost anything. You know, I can apply it to building an ebook or, you know, automating my content using a scheduling tool that's kind of clunky that it, I think, I feel like it takes away from my creativity, but it helps me build more because I can get several days ahead and clear out time for writing my next ebook or whatever. So I'm now on a daily basis. I'm looking for hard things to do because I know that that's the path to getting where I want to be. I love that. Uh, one thing you mentioned earlier was looking at a picture of yourself and then seeing the change that needed to be made. And this is not the first time I've heard this and I've had this happen with myself. It's so interesting how we can, we can be in a state and not realize it because it has been so gradual. We don't realize that we've, we don't realize that we've put on 20 pounds, even, even if we might have gone on a scale a little bit. We don't see it until we see that third person view of a picture or something. And, and then we say, is that me? Is that really what I look like? Because I, I don't know if it's because we get this. We've been with ourselves for our entire lives. So we remember ourselves from we, when we were 18, 19, 20 years old. And then we just say, that's me. That's what I look like when I was 20 years old. And then we see ourselves in a picture and it's like, oh yeah, that is not me anymore. <laughs> so I, I'd love for you to dive into that. Any thoughts you have? Yeah, the, the, you, you touched, you kind of touched a nerve, like I'm getting the chills a little bit. Um, my pinned post in X right now is a picture of me when I was 17, juxtaposed against a picture of me at 50. And people who've known me forever and ever reached out to me after I posted that and said, you look like you haven't aged a day. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these people know my journey. They know my story. And it wasn't always like that. Like if you yeah. look at a picture of me when I was 29 years old or when I was 39 years old, look very different from the way I do now and what I looked like when I was 17. And I, I think one of the ideas that really resonated with me over the last, uh, you know, I probably read the book less than two years ago, but one of the most pivotal ideas that has reshaped my view of my present and my future comes from James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. What he says is, if you, if you want to achieve something, don't set a goal. Just decide who you want to be. Hmm. And th like that really changed a lot of things for me. And I, I did this whole exercise where I journaled, this is who I am. This is who I want to be. And a picture is a powerful reminder of that. If you can, you can look at a picture of yourself and say, hey, that's who I want to be. I'm having a good time with my friends. I'm standing there in front of, you know, Cinderella's castle with my family. I'm out on the beach looking great, you know, or, you know, there I am on the banks of the Charles River, 50 pounds overweight. You know, that's not who I want to be. That, I'm not in alignment with that. And a picture is a powerful visual representation of who you are. It's, it's like holding up a mirror to yourself. And I was in a space of yours a couple of weeks ago where we were talking about objective truth. Mm. I don't know if you remember that one. It was an yeah, awesome definitely. discussion. Yeah. And I presented this idea that I got from Don Miguel Ruiz's book, The Four Agreements, that every single person is living in an illusion of their own creation. And that's that's not objective truth. That's subjective. That's a subjective point of view that I have of the world and that you have of your world. It's different from mine. But when we hold up that picture of ourselves as a mirror, all of the subjectivity that we carry around with us is reflected in that image and in our brain at the same time. And I saw that picture and said, 
I don't want to, that's not who I want to be. And it would be another 10 years before I, I read James Clear. But yeah. I knew when I saw it, I didn't want to be that. And now I can look at pictures in the intervening time, especially in the last nine years since I really started this journey and say to myself, that's who I want to be. And I can say on a daily basis, I'm living the life of my dreams every day. I dreamed of living this life when I was 17 years old, and now I get to do it all the time. As far as a picture being motivation, let's, let's go back to when you're 39 years old, you're not in the shape that you want to be, and the picture you have is not who you want to be. Is holding up that picture of who you don't want to be the motivation, or is holding up a picture from when you were in better shape, when you were 17 years old, is that the motivation? That's, that's a great question, Artie. I don't know if I've ever really thought about it. And I, what I would say is, and it, it, I don't know where this conversation is going to go, but a lot of times when I reflect on my past, I, I'm, I'm a very self-critical person. You know, I, I don't beat myself up today as much as I used to, I, but I used to, like, I'm just hard on myself. And there's some things that I've done that I'm not proud of. And when I look back at when I was 17, you know, I want to shake that kid and be like, dude, you know, let me tell you a couple of things. But so I, I don't aspire to be who I was when I was 17. I can look at the picture of myself when I was 17 and appreciate that version of myself for who I was then. And also use that as a, uh, like a touchstone for who I want to be now. And you can, the, the question of, is the picture a motivator of who I do not want to be versus who I want to be? I, the way my mind works now, and I think that there's uh, like, it's the word I'm looking for. It, it, it's not psychology. It's like, it may be, it, there's some kind of, uh, research backed notion that if in your present mind, you envision a better future for yourself, an optimistic point of view, mm -hmm. that that tends to contribute to longevity in a very positive way. So I would rather presently focus on a good outcome for myself in the moment and in the future rather than look back on the past in some kind of denial or take a negative motivator, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Do you, when, when you make the decision to take on a challenge to, to introduce some difficulty into your life, to build resilience or build a better habit over time, do you tell people about it in that moment or do you wait until you've already done it? I think it depends. It depends. Um, the stakes always get raised when you tell people. And a lot of times I'll use that for accountability. I'll say, look, this is what I want to do. And I'm telling you because I want to be accountable. Hmm. But I don't always. Sometimes I, I think more what I do, Artie, is just hold forth the idea of hard work and pushing through resistance as a core value. And I had a conversation with my sons just a couple of weeks ago. I, you know, I, I was going to the cardiologist and I, you know, I could, you know, tell you all about this crazy medical journey that I'm on now that I'm 50 and I'm going through this whole battery of different tests. But I, I said to my kids, if something happened to me where I couldn't bore you with my daddy wisdom every morning, like I always do, if there's one takeaway that I want you to get from all the things that I've said, it's the importance of working hard and recognizing that the path to what you want is at the far end of hard work. And as long as you carry forth the idea that you're going to push through and work hard and make hard work 
your core value, that will trump talent and luck and everything else that there is. So hear me now and believe me later, son. This is the the main message I'm trying to deliver to you. And I can tell you, this is not what my sons want to hear, Artie. They, yeah. they, they want me, you know, my, my middle child is like, go pour me a glass of water, butler. Like, you know, they all, they all want things to come easily to them. And they want the things that they want to be easy. And, you know, I, I've, I've learned as a parent, don't praise traits, praise effort. If I keep telling my 11-year-old, you're the smartest kid in the room, he's going to start to dumb himself down because he doesn't want to run into problems that challenge the notion that he's the most intelligent. Hmm. And I'm sitting here telling him, no, no, no. When you get to a place where you're making mistakes and getting frustrated and failing repeatedly, that's how you know you're in the right place. Keep going. That's the key. To me, that's the whole key. And I, I do that every day, Hardy. I find things to fail at that are hard for me and I just keep going. I love that praising the effort and not the trait because if you praise a trait, I think everyone's experienced this to some degree, but if you get told you're smart or you're really good at something, that's it. You're getting praised for what you, the end result, basically like, I, I think it creates a sense of entitlement to some degree. Like if you're really smart, you should have a good job. You should have all of these things coming your way, scholarships, all of this kind of stuff. But that doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily the case because if you're really smart, but you don't put it forth any effort at all, then things aren't going to come your way. And eventually you're going to be in a situation where you're not, that smart compared to everyone else because everyone else maybe had that same starting point, but they continued to put in the work and then they became, they outpaced you and they, they got on top of the competition, which you are their competition. So I really like that. There's another uh, great author who I love to read. His name's Adam Grant. He's a behavioral psychologist. And I think a lot of the things that I'm talking about now relate to behavioral psychology. That's the medical branch that I was searching for a moment ago. Adam Grant talks about the spiral of perfectionism where, you know, perfectionism is a trap. And I know this all too well. I've battled with this in my life, but like, if you're a perfectionist, you're like, you're going to run up against something that you can't do. And then you'll take a step back. Like, wait a minute, I'm a perfectionist and that's too frustrating for me. I'm not going to try that. Let me find something that I know that I can do until you spiral into a place where you're stuck, like you're not going anywhere in order to validate your self-identity as a perfectionist. And traits are like that. Identity is like that. You know, there was another story that I heard about a, a, a girl who was a, she was a, a prodigious violinist. And everybody told her, you know, you're going to go on to play in the greatest philharmonic orchestras in the world. And you're going to be the world's greatest solo violinist. And she developed, or she, I think she got injured and she couldn't use her hand anymore. And at 15 years old, this identity that people had set for her was just blown to the wind. It was disintegrated. And so she had to search for something. She had to redefine herself. And I, one of the things that's really powerful about hard work and resilience is that if you define yourself by that, then you can be anything and do anything. It's like, you know, it's hard to play the guitar, right? You got to learn where the chords are and you got to bend your fingers in these positions. That's hard. But if you practice for half an hour a day, an hour a day, you'll get pretty good in a pretty short period of time. The only thing stopping you is your willingness to start and your willingness to suck for a while. Yeah. And if your if your identity is built on hard work and willingness to fail, then you can apply that to anything. Yeah, I I love music and I've played a few instruments. I'm not I'm not great at anything, but I I also know 
there when you're learning an instrument or something like that, you can you can make some progress and then you get to a point where you can play a song or play a few songs. And then you have kind of the same dilemma as when you first started. Rather than just not playing, not practicing versus practicing, it's do you practice something that challenges you or do you just play what you know how to play? Because it's fun to play what you know how to play. I've run into that multiple times when when trying to learn instruments. It's like, oh, I can play this song. I'm going to just play that. And that counts as my practice. But you're not really, you're not really growing. You're not pushing yourself. Artie, you're, you're, again, I'm getting the chills here because, you know, what we're discussing now with music is actually kind of, uh, it's like part of my personal longevity puzzle. I grew up playing the piano. I, I was classically trained in the piano. And when I gave up playing piano lessons, when I gave up lessons, my brother took up the guitar and he and I would just jam out for hours. You know, yeah. he loves the dead. So we would play all these dead songs and I would bring out the Bob Marley or whatever other folk rock songs from classic rock we were listening to on the radio at the time. And, you know, it, we had a ball and I left it for years and years. My wife got me this piano as a birthday gift before our kids were born. And I started playing a lot of the old songs that I played. My kids both play the piano. And to me, me going back into piano and exploring it is a way of, it, it's part of, it, I have a, one of the pillars of my longevity practice is mindset. And in within the mindset domain, there's a sub pillar of, there, there are three sub pillars in the mindset domain. One of them is continuous learning. Another one is resilience. And the third one is stress reduction. And the piano resolves all three of these. And in music in general re resolves all three of those mindset pillars because you have to be resilient. You constantly are going to make mistakes when you play music and you have to just sort of push through them and improve to the point where you don't make them as much. And um, continuous learning and, and you know, stress, like it, it all goes into that. And what's funny about what you said was I was reading something or listening to something where it was like most of the great musicians have a sweet spot that happens decades earlier in their 20s and 30s where they produce their best work and the rest of their career is spent playing the stuff that they made when they were truly brilliant creators of music. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm in this new phase of my life where I want to push myself to do hard things. And my kids are ridiculous. And, you know, so I, like I have this thing where I want to do like a weekly video of me playing and singing a song. I'm a lousy singer, but it's like, it's fun for me. And I have to, I have to be willing to look like an idiot and fail to do that. And now we want to take it a step further. I, my, my sons and I have been joking for about the last 10 days about starting a punk band that we call Gunky Puddle. And we have, we have this playlist of songs that are really just titles. But we haven't written any songs. And I'm sitting here, you know, when I was in my 20s out in L.A., I wrote a bunch of songs and people loved them. I would, you know, go around to coffee houses and play them and stuff, play them at parties. People loved it. And I haven't done that in decades already. And so for me and my kids to get together and, OK, we're going to have a punk band called Gunky Puddle. And our our title song is called Gunky Puddle. It's like, what a ball, what a blast and what a what a chance to bond with my kids with no screens, right? With no gaming or anything like this. It's just us getting together and having fun and laughing and creating something. I don't know. I, you tell me. Like, I think that's a beautiful thing. What a beautiful opportunity, right? I think it's beautiful, yeah. I When I look at, I, I try not to be judgmental about other people or anything like that, but I've seen people age in my life and... I I see people get stuck in just a habit of a loop, it seems like, where it's just like they just do the same thing all the time. And for me personally, I'm like, I want to I want to learn until my dying day. I want to be learning new things. It's still it's one of the few things, I mean, it's one of the big things that gives me purpose in life is to be like I'm an explorer of information and, and stuff like that. I love to just constantly be exploring, exploring perspectives, exploring new information and just learning. 
because I've, I've seen people get stagnant and they think they know everything at a certain age and they, they think they've seen it all and done it all and, and that their time is past them, the time for enjoying things. And it's like, I like it when I see people like you that are just still, it doesn't matter how old you get, you're still going to want to just explore new things and try new things and do things that are traditionally reserved for those 20, maybe 30 year olds. But I, I love that. I love that you're still wanting to do those things. Cause I, I look at myself and I'm like, I want to be basically a child in a certain sense for my entire life. I want to have that childlike curiosity and desire to do new things and try new things. So I love 100%, it. hundred percent, a hundred percent already. It's, it's like the Zen idea of beginner mind. Um, my, I, I'm going to write a post today about continuous learning. And one of the things that I do for continuous learning so that it's a habit that I'm sure I'm exercising every day is I'm learning Spanish. Hmm. And I was on vacation. It was two years ago in March. And I, I said to myself, you know, I'm going to learn how to speak Spanish because it's hard. And I've never learned a language other than English. And so many people around me speak Spanish and, and it's hard. So I'm going to try to do it. And I, I, I got myself a subscription to Duolingo and my wife looked at me and she said, you better not let that Duolingo subscription go to waste. I haven't missed a day of Duolingo. I, I would have to check, but I think it's been something like 825 days in a row mm. where I've studied Spanish. And this is one of the things, Artie, it's hard. And sometimes I have to like force myself to pay attention and make a bunch of mistakes. And it, you know, this is the kind of thing where, and like learning Spanish has been really transformative for me. When my son was in his soccer season last year, a lot of the parents spoke Spanish. A couple of them were not very proficient in English at all. And over the course of the season, I was able to communicate with them more and more. And it was really remarkable to have that kind of practical application of something new and challenging that I was learning. And what's really like, this is sort of a cue to you and the audience about what my mindset is. I can see the end of the Spanish course coming in like 18 months, right? Like I'm closer to the end of the Duolingo Spanish course than I am to the beginning. Hmm. And I'm already like having an internal debate about what language I'm going to learn next. Yeah. That's how my continuous learning value is exercised every day. And it's, you know, it's not just, it's not just learning information like Spanish. It's learning how to interact with my kids and get the most out of them. You know, it's yeah. learning like, you know, you mentioned reading before, my kids ask me, hey, if we won the Mega Millions, what would you do? And I look at it and I'm like, I would find more time to read. That's my answer. Mm -hmm. So the continuous learning, I'm going to post about it on X today. It's, it's a core value, Artie. Yeah. I, people that love learning, continuous learners are, are my people. I, I just love people that are just wanting to learn constantly because that's how I am. And I... I've used Duolingo. I actually have fallen off over the last few months. I I had a long streak, 400 something days. And then I was just, it was getting to the point where I was just kind of doing the same things. I was stagnating. Uh, and that was my fault. I wasn't pushing myself. But I think language, similar to music, it's one of those things that pushes you to see things in a different way and just kind of push you mentally. and. I love the the way that even learning a little bit of language lets you see things through a little bit of a different lens than you were seeing them before because language it shapes our world like we we describe things with language all the time and then we we learn a different language a little bit and we realize so they say things differently and that kind of shapes the way that they probably see the world like there's just a bunch of different ways that people use language and it just comes, it's, it's just something that 
when you start to learn a different language, you're like, oh, that's interesting that they place this word before the other word. It's it's very different. It, it's backwards from the way that we do it in English. And uh, I just I just love it. I I've you know I'm at that point in the Spanish course now where you know I, I'm seeing articles come before nouns and stuff like like I I yeah. see that kind of language reversal go on and and like realizing when I hear non-native English speakers speaking in that way they're actually mirroring their native language it's not that they it's not that they're bad at English it's that this is the way the words literally yeah translate into their language. And it's, it's funny with Spanish because I've had people tell me, you know, uh, native Spanish speakers don't like it when, you know, Americans try to roll up on them and speak Spanish. Mm. And I've experienced that. Like I've, I've had some of the parents on the team when we're having really intense conversations about our kids will say to me, I understand your English. You can talk to me in English, not realizing that me, like I'm not speaking in Spanish because I don't think that they understand the English. I like, I really want to practice my Spanish, mm, but yeah. I've also like, I'll go into Walmart and start asking people where things are. And they'll just kind of look at me like, huh? And then if I ask someone in Spanish, even if it's like really broken Spanish with basic words, they'll light up and walk me right over to where I want to go. And like, it somehow made their day that someone took the time to ask them, in a language that they understood where something was like something really basic like that. So, I, you know, people are funny. Um, one of the things that I'm always learning about Artie is people. And I, you know, I see it on X all the time. I was a communications major in college and communication has evolved over time with new generations of people and with new tools for communication. And so for as long as I'm engaging on these platforms with different kinds of people, there are opportunities to learn better ways of communication, whether it's how to use visuals or how to make my language more terse or how to better relate to somebody younger than me by encoding their cues in my language, as opposed to speaking the way that a 50 year old dude talks to people, I, you know, I, I get into that stuff. Yeah, I enjoy learning about things like that too. Uh, I was reading uh, Dr. Gene Twangy's book. It's about different generations. I'm, I don't know why I'm blanking on the title right now, but it, it covers, you know, millennials, Gen Z, uh, boomers, all the, all the different generations, silent generation. And I remember one of the things I remember from her book was how Millennials versus Gen Z use different emojis. So when you find something funny as a, a millennial, you do the laughing emoji. But if you find something really funny as a Gen Z, you use the the skull, skull and bones. I'm like dead, dead funny. And I'm like, oh, I started incorporating that into how I communicate a little bit. And it's it's just kind of interesting that we I mean, we forget how much we're shaped by our peers and how much our generations influence how we interact with other people because we're, especially when we're younger, we're surrounded by our generation a lot more and that shapes the way that we communicate. And then we go across generations and sometimes there's that like miscommunication, like that there's like, oh, you know, there's always the newest generation, the generation that's sitting around 16 to 18 years old is always looking at the generation that's in getting into their thirties as just old and outdated. And there's something, you know, there's something on the part of the younger generation that they should be a little bit more understanding, but also on the older generation for, they should be trying to understand the younger generation and, and paying more attention to how they're communicating and incorporating that a little bit potentially. This is uh this is an interesting conversation, especially as it relates to longevity and and parenting. Um, my middle son said for years, you know, people aren't really old until they turn 50. And then, you know, my 50th birthday was coming up and, you know, he got kind of quiet. Like he didn't say anything. And I turned 50, didn't say anything. But every, like, 
it, w- it wasn't until a couple of weeks after that he kind of pulled it out and he was like, well, you know, you're 50, so you're old now. And what's, what's actually really funny about that is that my kids, you know, I mentioned before, like I had this conversation with them where it was like, if something happens to me and I'm not here, my kids basically think that I'm immortal. Like they can't conceive of a world that doesn't have me as this huge part of it. And that's, you know, that's a, that's a cool feeling, but it's also a cool feeling to be humbled, to, to, to recognize the changing nature of generational communication and the influence of younger generations on the present and my place in that paradigm. Hmm. So, you know, you mentioned that, you know, sometimes you see older people fall into these routines or they have these fixed mindsets where they think things are the way they are and that's how they ought to be and they're not going to change. My mindset is the opposite of that. And it's like, okay, there, you know, the millennial generation, the Gen Z generation, all, every single person who I meet has something valuable to offer to me. And it's not about me. It's about them and who they are and how they see the world. And if I can get out of my own ego for long enough to pay attention and understand then I'll benefit from that. Like, and, and, you know, and rather than be closed off to it or scoff at it. Yeah. It it seems like maybe I'm just thinking about this wrong, but I feel like that kind of makes you feel younger when you, when you keep that openness to other people's perspectives and learning more, it makes you, because when you feel younger in the way that you're approaching the world, it almost seems to like go to the outside and you actually start to look younger. People that are really curious, you know, there's something in their eyes and something in their features that looks younger. You, you're 50 years old. I know 50 year olds, 50 year olds who look much older than you. You do not look your age. You easily could pass for 40 years old. And I find that remarkable. Like, there's and it I think some of it obviously the physical things that you're doing matter but I think there's also something about that mindset that you have that that way that you approach the world that creates a almost like a childlike presence in it and I I think that affects the way people look I I don't know maybe you have a different thought on that I you know I don't I, I, I don't know if I think about it in those terms. Like sometimes I'll look in the mirror and think to myself, okay, I look good. Or sometimes I'll look in the mirror and think, boy, oh boy, you know, I, I need to step it up. You know, yeah. like, you know, I think we all go through that when we look yeah. in the mirror, but I, I think, I don't know. I, I wonder, I, I don't think that I consciously wake up with an approach that says, I'm going to, I'm going to engage with the world with a childlike sense of wonder. I, mm. That's, that's not a, I, I, that's not a conscious thought or a goal or something that I wrote down in terms of who I want to be. Yeah. I think it's potentially an outcome of the other values and, you know, uh, like traits that I want to exhibit. Maybe I, it's hard to say, but I, I, uh, I, you said a word that m- means a lot to me and that's presence. You know, you said it had to do with childlike presence. To me, presence is like a value because I mentioned before, sometimes I'll, I'll look back on the past kind of darkly and critically of myself and my choices. And I'm, I'm, it's not a good place. Like I don't want to be there. And sometimes I'll look ahead with worry, fear, right? Like, oh no, you know, what if this happens? What if that happens? Ah, neither one of those states 
is where I really want to be. Where I want to be is in the present. I want to have presence. So if I can focus on where I am and what I'm doing and what's happening today, I'm happy. I'm content. And I think that that's kind of a childlike thing because that's how kids are. You know, most yeah. kids don't think to themselves, boy, I was a real wanker when I was three, you know, or holy cow, what kind of a job am I going to have when I'm 24? They don't think like that. They're just doing what they're doing. And I get, I get to choose. That's the other thing. Like I, I made, um, there's a guy who I really like that I consider a leader on X. And he was talking about, um, I can't remember what he was talking about, but I, what I told him, what I, my reply was something like, you know, instead of focusing on my problems today, I woke up and decided to just think about what I'm grateful for. And it changed my whole day already. It, Rather than be like, oh, I got to solve all these problems. All of a sudden it was like, I got all this stuff going on. It's a great day. And that simple mindset flip sustained me all day. And it, it was like, rather, rather than be anxious and worried about stuff I had to do or potentially bad outcomes, I got to choose what was going on in my head cognitively. Yeah. and. It, it's really, really powerful. And I, I can, because I, I, I attribute it to my meditation practice as much as anything. But when I become aware of where my thoughts are or become aware of a change in how I'm feeling in my body, I have this trick that I use to become present. And I, what I do is I just start engaging in my senses. What are two things I can see? What are two things I can hear? What are two things I can feel like the clothes on my body? And it's like, all of a sudden, I'm not thinking about, you know, whether the Celtics can beat the Mavericks or, you know, or, you know, bills or doctor's appointments or anything like that. I'm just sort of, I'm back in the space where I am focusing on what's right in front of me. And that's where I want to be. My girlfriend is very, very consistent with uh, journaling at night, doing gratitude journaling. And uh, I'm not, I'm not very consistent with it, but I, it's something I really admire about her because I can tell it changes her mindset and it puts her in the right mood before she goes to sleep. She doesn't sleep well still, but she, she definitely, she can keep a very positive attitude and, you know, people don't always see what's going on behind the scenes. I see her a lot more than everyone else sees her. So I know she has struggling moments that she has negative thoughts. I know she has all that, but people that don't see her as much, like she can be very positive and they think she's just a very positive person, but they don't see all the work that she puts into that. But I, I will say I can relate a lot to, you know, looking at your past and not dwelling on it, but you're like, man, I was an I was an asshole. I was a, I was not what I wanted to be at 17, 20, things like that. I, I have, a, I've done a lot of things that I'm not proud of, but I do think the mentality of, and I can also worry about the future too, but I think that mentality of just focusing on right now, what can you do? Like I have this and this and this, and why, why worry about all of this stuff and dwell on it when I have all of this stuff in my life right now? that I can be lifting up and making better. And like, I had a dog die last year and I, I miss him dearly. And I think about him constantly, but I, I have another, we, I have a dog that we have, we had before him that he's still alive. And then I have, we got another dog a little bit after he died. And I, I still, I feel so appreciative of them and I, I want to spend time with them and I love them. And it's just so nice to be able to refocus on the present. So I love, I love your attitude about it. Yeah. Yeah, man. You're, um, you're, you're like lobbing me these slow pitch softballs here. I journal every day. I, it's not a gratitude journal. It's not anything. It's just a free form journal. And mm -hmm. I spend like, like the journal is like the first domino that knocks down all the dominoes of the day. It's like, let's start this. Let's start the chain and that I yeah. sit down and I write in my journal 
And it, I used to do just five minutes a day. The pages that I have in my current journal are, they're shorter. So I, now I just do two pages, no matter how long it takes. It could take yeah. me seven minutes. It might take me 10. It doesn't matter. And I don't have any kind of structure. I just sit down and I just start to write and let everything. It's like turning on a faucet. Just let the water come out. Um, and sometimes it's gratitude, but you know, not always, not always. Um, and the dogs, to me, the dogs, uh, my partner in uh, who started on my journey with me was my dog and mm. he's gone now. Mm. I get really, really emotional when I think about that dog. But it was, it, you know, a big part of it was walking the dog and adding an extra walk with the dog. Yeah. And um, now I have two dogs. And the, the, the dog I lost, Milo, you know, I'm blessed. Artie, I have all these friends that I go back with all the way. Like before we could talk, I was friends with these, these guys. And I've got half a dozen friends that go back that far. And a lot more than that, that go back to when I was five and 10 years old. Like all of these friendships that have spanned my whole life. I'll never, well, I shouldn't say I'll never, but I never had a friend that was as good of a friend as my dog, Milo. Yeah. And like, I have two dogs now and we lost Milo to cancer and we were like, okay, we're not going to have a dog. And really, really quickly, my wife and I looked at each other and we were like, we need to have another dog in this house. And we got Josie and then <laughs> Joe. <laughs> This is another story, but we also have one of Josie's puppies, Bailey, who lives mm. with us. And like, I, I've never told this story before, but I was the one who brought these puppies into the world. And when we had this litter of puppies, we were like, we have to keep one of the puppies. So now we have Bailey too. And it's almost not fair. Like, it's almost not fair to compare Josie to Milo. And it's not fair to compare Bailey to him either. And Bailey is like super unique. Like I'll never give birth to another litter. Of, well, I, there's that word again. I have no plans on delivering another litter of puppies. Yeah. And, and you know, I kept Bailey, like he, this dog is unique in my life, but he's not, he's not Milo, but it's not really fair to Bailey and Josie or me to compare them to Milo. And, you, you know, we talk about presence and gratitude these dogs just love me to death. That's all they do. All they want to do or care about is loving me and my family. It's the greatest gift in the world. And they can, they're tireless. Like if I wanted to walk twice as much as I walk, they would be like, oh, let's go. And, uh, and I, my post this morning was about walking. I've, for the last year that I've been tracking, I've walked over 15,000 steps a day on average, mm. which is a lot of steps. And there are guys out there who brag about walking more. They do 20,000 steps a day. You know, one guy, 30, 37,000 steps he walked. Another guy did 50,000 steps with his eight-year-old daughter, right? Like, okay, that's cool. To me, the walking is like a huge part of the fitness of longevity. That movement is pivotal. It's a cornerstone, I called it. And the presence of the dogs is too. Because, it, you know, I'll never get Milo back again, but I have Josie and Bailey now. And that's, that's twice as much as enough. I got two of them. And it's like, you know, I'm thankful for, I'm much more thankful for the benefit of having those dogs now in the present than I am sad that I lost a being that was you know, maybe the best friend I'll ever have. Maybe. I love that because I, there is a certain part of you. Uh, so I got, I got Zoe a month and a half or two months after Bandit died and Bandit died very unexpectedly. He was fine one day and then died. And I'm pretty sure I know why he died. But uh, after he died, it was just, empty. It just felt like the house was too quiet. It was like, man, there's just something missing in the house. And it's like, I, I didn't want to replace him. And that was never the point. Zoe has a similar uh, 
some similar patterns to him. She's a different breed. She's a, I think she's a Corgi Chihuahua mix where Bandit was a, a, a mini pincher Chihuahua mix. And he might have had something else in him too. But I talk to my dogs sometimes and I'll tell Zoe, I'm like, I really miss Bandit, but I, I don't. I, I still love you very much for who you are, and I don't expect you to be Bandit. I want you to be you. I love you for you, you know? It might be a little corny to talk to your dogs, but I do. I love talking to my dogs and, and showing them love. And uh, it's been a little bit heavy on me lately. Uh, Bandit died on April 25th of last year. And so just had the anniversary of his death. And uh, lately, I've been reminded... Well, I've, I take my dogs for walks every day and there's a pond over here where I just, it's the same route I take every day. And there's a reminder of how Bandit died. I'm pretty sure. Um, I think he, I think he got into hemlock actually. Um, so he died in April and then a few weeks later I, I walked by a normal spot and I remember vivid, uh, not vividly, but I remember the weekend before he died, I was, I took them for a walk and I was like, I'm not in a rush. I, I liked, I liked not being in a rush and bandit eats grass sometimes. So he was eating grass, chewing on grass. And I was just letting him spend more time chewing on grass near the edge of where the pond, uh, drops off. And then the next day he was weird, just lethargic. And then he died later that night. And, uh, a couple of weeks later, there was spray paint, like this pink paint on, and it said poison. And I was like, what, what, what is this? And I found out it was hemlock. And then this year, a couple of weeks, uh, about a week and a half ago, on Memorial Day, I sent a letter to the HOA. I was like, there's hemlock. Like, I'm, I'm 100% sure. I, I checked it out with Google and uh, used AI to make sure that I was seeing the right thing. I'm like, it hasn't flowered yet, so we need to get rid of it. And uh, it's still there. They're treating it right now to get rid of it. But every time I walk past that, it's like, it's just a reminder of what happened. And it, it it's just been heavy on me lately. So, yeah. Yeah, Artie, um, I'm really, really sorry. Like, yeah, I, I feel you. your sadness and I understand it. And, you know, I the... When I, when I think about people, I, I wrote a newsletter a couple of weeks ago about pets and I don't even like to use the word pets. Like yeah, I, I, mean, I like to say animal companion, I, you know, and I don't, you know, I, I think, you know, and like these, these creatures are dogs. They're not people. I don't persona, I, I, like I don't, I don't anthropomorphize my dogs at all. I don't, I don't like that. When I see people do, I think to myself, well, that's something other people do that I choose not to do. But anyone who's had an animal companion understands the pain of losing their companion. And yet there are differences and uniquenesses about all of our stories that make them really intensely personal. So it's weird. It's like this shared experience that no one really understands at the same time. Yeah. And so, but so much of what you describe mirrors my experience. And I'll tell you, my, we lost Milo to cancer. So we watched him decline for several months. We spoiled him like a, like a king. We gave him hamburgers and chicken and yogurt and peanut butter every day and all the love you can imagine. And he, he, he had, to, he spent his last day out back here. We, we called a special vet to euthanize him in our backyard under our tree. And, you know, we call it the Milo tree. And I'm, you know, I'm telling you this story as I look at the tree of life behind you in your studio, they're like, you know, I, I get, I mean, we're having this conversation about our dogs. I get sad. We get sad. Right. Yeah. But like, I, and the, you know, maybe this sounds corny. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a Muslim and I'm a man of really deep faith in God. And, uh, like 
I know when, when I need a comforting presence, I can go out to that tree and, you know, I can even just look at the tree and look at the spot where we all lay on the grass together and receive that energy. And it's, it's a really powerful thing. It's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a really positive memory because it creates, it, it reminds me of the positive power of this being who came into my life for a very short time and then passed on. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of life is like that, right? There, we all experience loss in our lives. Gain and loss are almost inevitable. So I don't know. I, I, I don't have like a neat little summary point on this. I don't think I just, I, I think what I would really like to do is acknowledge you because I remember a couple of weeks ago when you shared that it was the anniversary of bandit's death. And I, I'm sure that I commented on that post. It was like, you know, I know how hard that is. And now we're sharing these stories. I think it's cool, man. I think any, any time you talk to anybody where you have common ground, that that's pretty cool. So. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. I, it's one of the harder things for me. I, I can talk about it, but I'm still getting used to the fact of uh, the idea of sharing more personal stuff because I can talk abstractly. I can talk about ideas all day, but when it comes to, I mean, I haven't cried, but I, I can feel some tears welling up uh, at certain points of this conversation. Now, I wasn't planning on talking about bandit and dogs, but I do love dogs. Um, but it's funny when it's not funny. It's when your dog dies, it's an interesting reality that you find yourself in because if you have a family member die you your family member had a life of their own outside of your house so they have these like relationships with other people and other people know them maybe even see different personality points of theirs that you don't and and they have these different relationships with them but when your dog dies or cat whatever your animal, whatever your companion animal is, um, there is, it, it's just not the same because you and maybe a few other people in your, your home have that relationship with the animal. And outside of your home, it's kind of weird because it's like you are just in so much pain and then you go outside and it's like people have a lot of, people can relate, but people don't understand the loss that you've actually experienced because they just don't know your animal in the same sense. And it's like, it kind of, it's hard not to feel a little like frustration in those moments because it's like, you know, people will say, I'm sorry that your dog died. And, and people knew Bandit, but it's like nobody knew him like Holly and I know Bandit. Like nobody saw him every morning how and how cuddly he was and how he was just this dog that just had this endless amount of love to give. And I'm sure you have the same experience with, uh, with Milo, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, it is, it's a lonely, lonely loss that you experience when your animal dies. And it is what it is. It's just, it's a very unique thing. Yeah, it's 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 like I said, it's a shared experience that's still completely unique on a case by case yeah. basis for exactly the reason that you say. Yeah, you know, n like I, I, people lose their animals, and it's like this devastating loss and absence in their life. You talked about it, and it, it, like I experienced it my way because of the experience that I had with Milo, and you experienced it your way because of the experience that you had with Ben. And I like, I, it, it's funny because you, you, in, in the course of what you said, you started talking about sharing things that are personal and like the, uh, uh, 
on X, on social media, in the public sphere in general, whether it's in your office or, you know, in your neighborhood or whatever, there, there are sort of norms and boundaries that govern these conversations. And especially on social media, there's always like, there's always this sense of how personal do I want to be? How much do I really want to share versus you know, what, what am I going to keep private? Mm -hmm. And I think in some cases for some people that that can be kind of toxic. It's like they present this version that's not really true. It's what they want people to see. And other people, I think, you know, people talk about authenticity all the time and people talk about authenticity as like, this is what you have to do to be seen and be interesting. Like, like that's, that's like, you need to overshare and share everything. I think that there's a fine line and yeah, I agree, you know, for me, like you don't see me posting pictures of my kids on X very much, if at all. And my wife and I made an agreement many years ago that we, that's not how we were going to use our social media. Um, but if I know you and I trust you, I'll DM you a picture of my kids to like, to like really share a, a personal anecdote because it's, it's a personal connection, social to a large degree. And one of the things that I talk about with longevity is community. You know, your community is part of what sustains you for the long term. So you have to choose your community wisely. And I'm a person I've talked to, you know, my community mentors, Christelle, and she's just absolutely fantastic. Yeah. I've talked to her a lot about how I'm actually a part of many different communities, each of which is, you know, a, a part of a different facet of my life. And, um, you know, it's, it's important to cultivate those relationships. It's important to build really meaningful connections with other people and stories like this about Bandit and Milo. You know, stories with my with my basketball community about how my son reacted when he saw Porzingis enter the game last night. Mm. It's like, you know. It's important to. I, I think that it's important to have boundaries and to know that there are certain places where you just don't want to go. Like, I'm not going to use my kids pictures to try to gain followers on X. I'm not going to do that. But. If I'm building real relationships with people in a community, sharing anecdotes about Milo or sharing rare pictures of my kids that are candid, I think that's a good thing because, yeah. and this is part of the system. It's part of the practice. It's, it's critical to cultivate strong relationships core relationships, like in your family, in your house where you live and community relationships. I agree. I, and I agree that there's a fine line with uh, what you should be sharing. I think, I, I think it's smart not to share too much, uh, like use your kids for gaining followers and stuff like that. I, I don't like that. And there's a lot of, I mean, you're, the internet is a big place and everyone has access to it. You, you have no idea what the intentions of people who could be viewing things are. And, uh, I think you want to be careful of what you're sharing. And I think everyone has a right to keep things to themselves. Like you don't have to share everything. And I, I don't think it's right to share everything. And some people are going through struggles and, and, feeling negativity and stuff like that. And there's a certain amount of that that you can share, but then there's also like some of that you should be careful about putting out there because you're putting out an energy when you post and stuff like that. So do you want to be putting out negative energy or do you want to, you know, deal with that a little bit by yourself? Like, I think it's good to share, like I've shared it like, Hey, I, you know, I'm, I'm struggling a bit this week. It's been hard to keep on track with things. And you shared a post recently where it's like, you said, I, I did not do what I wanted to do. Like I did not live up to what I wanted to be today. 
And it's okay because tomorrow I get to do it. I get to hit it and just crush it. I know I can do that. I love that. I'll tell you, if, if you don't mind my reflecting on that a little bit, that was yesterday. And, yeah. you know, I, I took the time to develop a new content strategy for Longevity Chronicles that involves the use of a scheduling tool to automate my posts so I can build that queue up ahead of time and then use my time during the day for more videos or more longer form stuff. Like I, I, I want to I wanna build up that queue. And so what I started to do to try to go faster was I started using AI. You know, I went right to chat GPT and said, hey, help me. I, I'm, I'm filling up my funnel. Help me out. And so chat GPT started spitting out all this stuff. And I started curating and editing and all this stuff and using it. And I was like, was really unsatisfied by that. It was like, I was like, wait a minute. This is, this is not who I want to be. I do not want to be a guy who goes to chat GPT to say, help me make content and then does that. I, I think that I'm not, I, I, first of all, I love AI. I'm not one of these guys who's like a Luddite that wants to bury my head in the sand about AI. I'm leaning into it because it's hard and also because it's fun. Like mm-hmm. I love d- exploring AI and this sort of thing, but using AI to write for me, that, that's not who I want to be. I want to write my own stuff and have it be in my own voice. And even if I take what the AI said and splice it up and edit it and mix in my own stuff, it's still not the same. It didn't feel the same. Mm. And when I went at the end of the day, when I went back and said, boy, oh boy, this, you know, this was off. I, I had a bunch of stuff on my plate and things just got out of whack and, you know, not good. It didn't feel right. That, that post where I was like, okay, I, I had a setback, but I'm going to push through it. And this is really how I feel. And that thing lit up like a Christmas tree. Yeah. And it was like, okay, maybe, maybe that's instructive in a way, but maybe it's just like a, it's like a sign. It's like a, it's like a, it's a guide. It's a touchstone because yeah. I, like I, I can use AI for all kinds of things. I don't need to use it to write for me. And I don't want to like, I, I, it's important to have for me that kind of authentic voice. So today, I what I started to do is just grab ideas, and I, you know, my brain. You you spend ninety minutes talking to me. You can see that my brain is very associative. So I start getting these ideas, saved a bunch of images, and now like I have my my new content plan. Some of what I, some of what I grabbed today, I'm not going to post for another week. But I have a relevant story to tell about that image as it relates to what I'm doing with the Longevity Chronicles. And this to me is better. Like if I can write that post and schedule it a week from now, I'd rather do that than wake up and be like, chat GPT, help me, help me fill up my funnel today or whatever. Like you following me? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, The way I use I do use AI to write something. Um, my newsletter, I actually use AI for, but it's, and I, maybe I'll get away from this at some point, but I use it because I, I feed my interviews into AI and then I have it create the newsletter based on the conversations that I have. And I like that a little bit better because it, I might focus on something, but the AI will give me something different that, and, and plus, a two hour conversation, sometimes you don't remember everything that's said and you forget some of the moments that could be very useful for people. So I do use AI a little bit in my newsletters, but I don't use it in any of my content that I write because uh, on X or anything like that, because it just doesn't feel authentic to me. And what I, and I'm also pretty early in my newsletter journey. So it's like, I, I don't have a huge newsletter audience or anything like that. So I feel like I can experiment a little bit with it. But what I'll use AI for is if I'm in a conversation that is philosophical and, I, and I'm trying to maybe make an argument or make it, make a point, I will write everything that I want to write and I'll feed it into AI and ask it questions like, is there anything, are there any flaws in my logic here or anything like that? So I'm writing everything, but I'm using it as a, instead of going to Holly or a friend and saying, will you read this and tell me what you think about it? It's like real time. I could just get that information and feedback. 
So I use it for constant feedback. And I love creating AI images too. So I, 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 love I use images. AI a lot. The, the, the image, the use of it for image creation is something that I, I really, really love. And I'm yeah. starting to learn editing more and effects. I've got mentors in the AI art space who are trying to funnel me toward animation tools for the images that I'm generating. So like this is part of my continuous learning journey for sure, like embracing AI and its possibility. The feedback thing is interesting because what I find almost all the time is that the AI I'm working with is just validating me. Like, oh yeah, mm. that looks great. Oh, ter- yeah, this is, let me tell you why what you just did is great. It's like, dude, yeah. what are we even doing here? Right? I, like <laughs> sometimes I'm in it. I'm like, I'm wasting my time. I could just, you know, all the time I'm spending interacting with this tool, I could be creating something. And the, 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 but the feedback thing, like the, 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 the logical fallacy use case is really interesting to me. The blind spot use case is interesting to me. I, it, uh, the ebook that I wrote, which uh, I'm going to plug my thing. If you go to my, if you go to my X profile, there's a link to my buy me a coffee where you can get my ebook fundamentals of longevity and there's not one word that was generated by AI in that book, but I wrote it with AI because I I was sitting there and I was like, okay, this is the structure of my book. And this is what I want to write about. You know, let's brainstorm. You know, if you, if you had to say ideas about these three things in 50 words or less for this one slide in the ebook, go ahead and, you know, show me what you got. The AI would spit something out and I'd be like, thanks a lot, but I don't really like that that much. Mm-hmm. And then just write my own thing. And it was like this sounding board where it was like me rejecting the AI, but somehow that process got me to where I wanted to be faster, if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know. Like, it, I think, you know what it was? I think that writing the ebook was hard for me and that starting it was hard. Like, I'm having a hard time starting my next ebook. And that the AI made it easier because it was fun. It was like, I, I'm, I'm struggling to start. I'll just ask chat GPT what it thinks about this. And yeah. all of a sudden I started. And that was what that, you know, it was the pebble that started the avalanche. And it, I, I, I haven't thought about that until just right now, but that's an example of a hard thing that AI made easier. And now I know where to go when I'm when I need to get started on the next one. Yeah, it's it's nice using AI. I'm I can think deeply about things, but sometimes I'm a little scattered in my thoughts. And it's nice to just I can just write a long paragraph into Chat GPT or, or Claude or whatever AI I'm using and have it restructure. So I'm giving it what I want it to. For instance, I created a uh, a trivia space that I launched last night. And I, I mean, the whole idea was mine. AI comes up with the questions and that's part of the fun of it. But I created all the rules and everything, but I didn't create them in a structured way. And then I just had it structure them back to me. So I'm like, okay, now like you understand what I'm trying to get at here. Now feed the rules as you understand them back to me. And then I gave it a little back and forth and I'm like, no, this isn't what I mean there. And it's like, for somebody like me, that's not always organized. You can just get, you can clarify what you're going for a lot faster. And I, I've always wanted to write a book, but I, I haven't. And I feel like I'll use AI to write a book or an ebook or whatever I I do for that reason too, is I, for the structure part of it, because it can take things from a bird's eye view and be like, Oh, this is how you want to structure it. And for the, for the feedback thing, it can just be affirming with what you give it, but you can also prompt it a certain way and say, tell me the flaws that I have in my logic here or or point out any flaws or, or however you want to prompt it. But sometimes saying, what do you think about this? it prompts it almost to be like, oh, I think it's great and blah, blah, blah. I have created a, a chat bot that's just, I call it Meanie. You, you might have heard Christelle mention it on Spaces. I created Meanie and Happy Feet. Meanie is the AI bot that just 
sees everything negatively. And then happy feet is the one that's disgustingly optimistic. And uh, they balance each other out a little bit. I would love, I would love to play around with both of those. I think yeah. that, that that would be a fun exploration for me. And, you know, a, a, to me, AI, this kind of thing, growing up, you know, I, I'm a child, like I was born in 1973, I'm 50. And we got our first Apple II E, I think it was 1985. And ever since then, I've watched my mom in particular struggle with every single piece of new technology that ever comes down the road. And I, God bless my mom. I talked to her yesterday and I told her, you're an example for how I want to live my life when I'm 80. I told mm. her because she, she's going out and meeting new people that she like, she said to me, you know, I kind of didn't want to meet with them and it would have been really easy for me to just back out and bail and stay in the apartment. But I, wanted to push myself and try and meet new people just to validate whether my instinct about them was right. Or I met somebody cool that was new. And I was like, Ma, you, you did it. You're doing it. Right. Yeah. So, you know, but like, I, I never want to be a person who ages badly with technology. I want to embrace it. When I worked at Accenture, they sent us all, you know, it was before Meta made the acquisition and they were, they sent us all these Oculus headsets. And people were like, oh, what do I do with this Oculus? I just got in there and I was like, man, this is the coolest thing ever. Yeah. And, you know, it, we had a ball with it. We had, we had a ball with it for a long time. So yeah. I, I think this, like, to me, this is the kind of thing that I, I see it in the workplace. I see it all the time where people have a mindset where they don't want to try something new. They don't want to embrace the new. They want to revert back to an idealized version of something that probably never even really was to begin with. I agree. And, you know, I like, I, I don't see that as being useful. Um, you know, this is an idea that I'm having just now, but, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of a nostalgic guy, but nostalgia is, kind of a form of depression. It's, you know, you look back on something with such fondness that it takes you out of where you are now and the vitality of where you are now, just wishing for something else that maybe even wasn't the way you remember it to be. Yeah. Yeah. We, we tend to look back on things and think that there were way like people talk about the nineties and how great the nineties were. And it's like, there are not things, there are things that were not great in the nineties. And I'm sure even a, on a personal level, there were things that sucked for people in the nineties, but then they look back. And I think part of that is that you're looking back on something that you don't have to deal with anymore, that you're not like in the thick of things anymore. So it's easy to just look at the positive things, but the reality is it's, it's I agree with you. It's probably not the way it really even was at that time. So, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if we can, as far as longevity is concerned, I'm wondering if we can get a little bit more detail about, like, maybe go into your routine. Like, how do you, like, on a, maybe a week basis or a two week basis, what do you do? Like, you wake up, you go for a run, do you, like, when do you exercise and what kind of foods are you eating and, and how do you approach all of that? Sure. That's really cool. I love talking about this. I'm, uh, I'm a creature of habit and the routines and the habits that I have are part of what sustains me. I'm a very early riser. Every day during the week, I'm up at 4.30. Mm -hmm. If I allow myself, I'll sleep in until 5 a.m. on the weekend. I have, you know, I have a routine where I get up and I kind of take care of my body. And then I, I come downstairs. I set up the kitchen so that whenever my kids get up, They've got their vitamins and their, you know, whatever else they, you know, their chocolate milk and stuff like this. And, and then I meditate and I do my yoga practice. My meditation is 10 minutes a day. My yoga practice is 30 minutes a day. And then I walk the dogs that takes 30 minutes. And then I, and then after I walk the dogs, I feed them. And like, there are, there are details in this routine that are, they're so well established that I know where I'm going to put my feet. Hmm. So like 
after I do my yoga, before I walk the dogs, I do this thing that I call opening up the house where I go around and I open all the blinds and move the car out of the driveway so my, my, my wife can get out. And like, we have these French doors in the back and, I, and I'm pulling up the blinds. And as I go from panel to panel to the door, I do this thing with my feet where I'm, it's like this crossover footwork pattern that I have that come, goes back to the days when I played soccer. And I do it, I'm like, you know, this is my habit, this is what I do. And what's, what's interesting about this, Time management is not my best skill, but where, where I realize I'm failing in time management a lot of times is in transitions. If I could make my transitions more efficient and less distracted, I would gain back more time. It, you know, it goes back to the, the mindless behavior on the phone a lot of the time. But I have, you know, these transitions are built into the time. And, and it like this routine changes a lot. And my wife is going back to work for the first time in 10 years. So all the routines are going to change, but I break my day into quarters. So I have the first quarter of the day is a family quarter where it's a lot of self-care and getting everybody up and dressed and fed and out the door or whatever. And if we're going out the door, then we're going out the door together or the kids are going to school, whatever. The second and third quarters are about work. So it's a nine to five job, creator stuff. It's about the work that I'm putting in. And then the fourth quarter is also a family quarter. So people talk about work-life balance like it's this elusive thing. I'm a sports guy. I break my day up into quarters. First and fourth are for family. Second and third are for work. Hmm. With regard to fitness, my, this is my routine. I, I, have, I have a five-day cycle that I repeat. So it turns into a 10-day cycle. And what I do is... I do four days of work and one day of rest. Days one and three are, I, I always do the yoga and the walking every day. Even on my days off, I do yoga and walking. But on days one and three, I do strength training, resistance training. It's usually 35 to 45 minutes of weights. Sometimes there are hits, like, like a high intensity interval training. I vary it. Like I'll do, I'll do upper body one day. I'll do lower body, total body. Like I tend to vary it up to keep it fresh and fun. But days one and three are about weights. Days two and four are about cardio. And I now I have a I have a stationary bike that I use. I have iFit. It's a Nordic track bike. And I'll ride for 35 to 40 minutes on days two and four. And then on the fifth day, I rest. And then I repeat that. So really what it is, is every 10 days, I have four days of weights and four days of cardio and two days of rest. And as long as I stick to that, I know I'm developing my strength the way I need to. I'm developing my mobility and agility because of the yoga. And I'm also keeping my heart strong. And what's cool about iFit is with the cardio, I know I'm up in what they call zone two, where I'm sustaining an elevated heart rate for a long period of time. But they also bake in intervals. So I'm doing what they call VO2 max. I'm pushing my heart to its limit to make it stronger. From a nutrition standpoint, I have an app that I call Lose It. Well, I don't call it Lose It. They call it Lose It. And I journal all my food. And I've got to the point where over the years, I know exactly where my sweet spot of calories is to maintain my weight, to lose weight, or to gain weight. And it's my son's birthday coming up, and we're going to get this delicious, unbelievable cake from an artisan baker that lives in the neighborhood. We bake homemade cinnamon buns. We're going to go out for dinner. Like I train all the time. So it's my son's birthday week. I can enjoy myself, right? But I know that I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to pay the price for that. Um, but I journal all my food. And what I've, what I've learned recently is that protein is the centerpiece of all my meals. So I'm emphasizing protein, even at breakfast. I like whatever it is, I'm making sure that I'm getting a minimum of 30 grams of protein every time I sit down to eat. Hmm. And I, I also do intermittent fasting, Artie. So some days I'll do a 14-10 fast where I'll fast for 14 hours and eat from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. My fast always begins at 8 p.m. On the days when I start at 10 a.m., a lot of times I'll have four meals. And they're all, you know, if I get four meals that have 30 grams of protein, 
I'm getting 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight, which is, that's, you know, I'm going to develop muscle and get stronger and accelerate my metabolism and burn fat that way. And on the days when I'm 16, eight on my intermittent fast, when I eat from 12 PM to 8 PM, sometimes I only have two meals and that's not as efficient of a protein intake. But usually when I'm 16, eight, my calories drop significantly and that helps me lose weight. And it really is di- like, it'll vary day to day depending on my schedule. A lot of days, like today I knew, like we're talking from 11 to one my time. So I ate at 10 AM cause I knew I didn't want to go through this thing on an empty stomach and I'm, I'm good. Like I'm flexible. I'm not so rigid that I have to do it the same way every day. But I also know if I'm eating something after 8 PM, it's usually something loaded with sugar that I probably shouldn't be eating at all. And I've, over the years, I've learned like I can have, like, if I really want ice cream, I should only have like an eighth of a cup of ice cream. I should have three mouthfuls. And I met, like, I'll measure my berries. I'll weigh out my protein. Like I'm really detailed about it because I know if I want to achieve my goals, I have to, I have to measure it. And I've reaped, like I lost all that weight when I started journaling my food. And I've written about this extensively. Hmm. If you really want to lose weight, you got to journal your food. Even if you just start by writing down what you're eating and you don't know what the calories are. If you write down, I had a bag of chips. All of a sudden, that's staring you in the face. And if you're not losing weight, well, I, I can't write down that I'm eating a bag of chips if I want to lose weight. Yeah. So these habits also, they feed my circadian biology. So all of my systems, my digestive system, my, you know, my, um, my circulatory system, my respiratory system, I can hold my breath like you wouldn't believe because of all this work, like I can swim back and forth, like I can swim 50 meters underwater without taking a breath. And my kids are like, holy, you know, where did daddy go? And like the, the, that's the fitness and that's the nutrition. I, if, if I have 1500 calories a day, I'm a small guy. I'm five, five. I weigh, I probably weigh between hundred and 145 pounds. If I have 1500 calories a day, I'm probably going to start putting on weight. So my sweet spot is usually between 1200 and 1350. And, um, you know, that, that means that 400 calories is a big meal for me. If I eat 400 calories, I walk away and I'm like, oh man, I ate so much. Usually 350, 350 is usually pretty good. And then I can have the desserts are really funny. If you watch me, like I'll have three bites of ice cream. I'll have three chocolate covered almonds, right? Mm, Just a taste. And that, like, I feel great right now. I had surgery at the end of March and that coincided with Ramadan and Ramadan is like, it's hell on the body because all of these circadian systems just get completely turned on their head and the tendency to overindulge, I'm automatically eating past 8 PM. Like everything just comes apart. Plus Mm. I had the surgery. Plus yeah. my son's birthday, like I, I, I went on tilt. And so I'm still recovering from that, but I, I feel great. And I know once my son's birthday is over that I'm going to have about six months of just sweet groove leading into the holidays. And, you know, I'm, I know that I'm going to hit a new peak of fitness this year and it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing feeling. And it's, it really does contribute to my longevity and it contributes to my, the lowering of what they call the epigenetic age that I have, because I'll get to a point after a week of indulging with my son for his birthday. All right. Now I got to gear up again so I can work hard enough to be better than I was before. Hmm. And it's like this constant push toward this ideal state and maybe I'll get there one day and maybe I won't, but as long as I keep climbing and keep pushing myself, that's the journey. 
that that's what it's all about. It's not about this idealized state of my own fitness. It's about the daily process of doing my best that day so that my actions align with my values. I love it. I love, uh, thank you so much for diving into that because I, I've been doing intermittent fasting. I do a 16 to eight. I've been doing that pretty consistently. I usually have one day a week where I don't, but, or probably not, I, maybe one day a week, but I know it's not enough. I know there's a little bit more that I have to add to really get where I want to, want to go. So I, I love the insights you shared to it. I, I have a couple questions on that. One, do you, do you do longer fasts? Do you do like a day, 24 hour, 48 hour fast? Do you do those ever? Throw those in? So no, like I don't, I, I haven't, I haven't learned about how a longer fast might benefit me. So I, mm-hmm. I haven't done that. I've seen people do it. And I know there are some people who swear by different kinds of fasting routines like that. Uh, I'm a little bit curious about it. And I probably, you know, what this says to me is that I probably should look at it because it sounds hard to me. Um, you know, it sounds like a challenge. I, the, the longest fasts that I've had have been during Ramadan. You know, there, there were some days where the fast would begin before 4 a.m. and end at 8.30. So I guess that's, you know, a 16 and a half, 17 hour fast on a daily basis for a month. It's, it's hard. Like the older I get, the harder that Ramadan fast. Like I, what, what you, I, and again, I go back to the meditation. I've become more aware of the, not just the physical, but the mental challenge of sustaining a fast like that for a long time. It's hard. Mm, yeah. um, it affects your concentration and your mood. But no, like 16, 8 and 14, 10, Dr. Sachin Panda did a, a whole bunch of documented research on this where he, what he determined was that 14, 10 was actually the optimal window for extended health span, which is, mm. that was when I switched from 16, 8 was perfect for calorie re- restriction, but somehow he says 14, 10, maybe the allowance of more protein is part of what's going to contribute to that. I don't know, but I'll go. I'll go back and forth. It depends on the day. How much sleep do you get when you go to bed each night? I don't get enough sleep. This, and I've written about this extensively. The sleep is the Achilles heel of my longevity program. On a good night, I get six hours of sleep. And it's not because I have trouble sleeping. When my head hits the pillow, I'm out. And um, the quality of my sleep generally is pretty good. But I have a very busy lifestyle where I need to wake up early to accomplish everything that I want to do. And I go to bed late because I treasure having bedtime with my kids. And I don't want to rush through dinner and walking the dogs to brush my kids into bed. I just sort of let. And part of that is also making accommodations for my wife, who lives a a different kind of lifestyle than the one that I live. Um, And I, I love that about her. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> we do another podcast about how the how my wife's differences from me are something that I constantly learn from that challenge me in just absolutely wonderfully delightful ways. And the idea that I can make personal sacrifices to uplift my wife is that's that's in line with my values, my values as a husband and a father and a helper, right? She's, if she wants to do things her own way, I, I want to honor and cherish that. But, uh, you know, we're, we're starting to get better in that regard because now we're going for family walks after dinner, which means I don't have to walk the dogs after the kids are in bed and I can gain back a lot of time that way. The biggest problem is this. It's my phone. I, and I was talking about this in somebody's podcast, coach Jacob, I, I do all this work and I work so hard and I'm so focused. And this is a, this is kind of a cool anecdote. My buddy Hendo is always talking about the movie, her and how it relates to what we're all experiencing with AI now. So I'm watching this movie, her, and I can only watch it in half an hour chunks, but I'm like, I, I watch the movie on my phone 
And then I flip through X on my phone and then I play a couple rounds of Tune Blast on my phone. And the next thing I know, I'm getting five and a half hours of sleep instead of six and a half hours. Mm. And I need to change this. If Coach Jacob hears this, he's going to take me to the woodshed. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I had to ask about the sleep because for 430, that means if you were trying to get eight hours of sleep, you're in bed by 830, which is, I could never do that. I mean, it doesn't matter how early I go to, how early I'm waking up. I don't think I can go to sleep at 8.30. The light, especially in the summer, the light is still out a little bit at that time. So 10 is, even 10 is kind of hard for me to get to bed by. So, but I'm, I'm awake at 7.30, so I need to wake up earlier. It's my Achilles heel, Artie. And I, I idealize seven hours of sleep. Like I, if I could get seven hours, I, I could check the sleep box. And I struggle and struggle. There, were, there, there's, there are times when I can do it sometimes, but then my wife gets really frustrated, like I'm rushing around too much. And um, I think if I mastered my phone, that I'd give myself a chance to do it. And it's a hard thing that I'm avoiding. So that's a cue that I have to figure that out. I really do. The other thing I want to ask about and and we'll wrap up pretty soon. Um, the five days is interesting because that puts day one on a, a different day each week. So why five days? Why not seven days? Over the years, I've experimented a lot with different workout cadences. Uh, there's a whole chapter in my journey already about how my wife got me to go to Orange Theory with her as an anniversary gift back in 2019. And I had like... I was in crazy awesome shape and I pushed myself so hard that I blew out my hips. I had labral tears in both my hips. I needed surgery to repair them both. And then the pandemic hit. We had to delay these surgeries. Our third child, our daughter was born. And it was like this whole crazy chapter over the last nine years of this longevity saga. And I pushed myself too hard. In those days, I did five days on. I would work out for five days and then take a day off. And I, I blew out my hips. Hmm. And, I, and then I, what I find is if I do two days and then take a day off, I don't feel like I'm working hard enough. So somehow in the middle of all this, varying the workouts so that I'm emphasizing different outcomes every other day and then taking a day of rest has become much more sustainable for me. It's, just, it's about sustainability of it's about it's about pushing myself as hard as I can and sustaining it and being injury free. And if you talk to Dr. Peter Atia and Huberman and Dan Go, fit founder, who's one of my favorite accounts that I follow on X, injury prevention, Dr. Andy Galpin, injury prevention is the number one goal of my fitness program, whether it's injury from uh you know, working out too hard or injury from picking up a bag of groceries that's too heavy. Yeah. Well, I love that. I mean, injury prevention is extremely important because it doesn't matter how good your routine is, is it if you if you break a leg or if you get a an injury that prevents you from your routine for three months, you are going to be off track no matter what. I mean your injury right now, it's gotten you a little bit off track and uh I, I'm sure it's gotten you a little bit off track and you're you're having to compensate for that a bit. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Artie, you, you said at the very top of this, that as you get older, it gets harder. It's true. I don't recover as quickly as I used to, but I, my mindset shift has made me have better outcomes because I'm much more patient than I used to be. I, when I, when I came off of the surgery and I was training back up, I knew I'm going to go back to beginner level. I'm going to take it slow. I, I'm not in a hurry. This is a game that I'm playing for the rest of my life. It's not a game that I'm playing so I can, you know, wear a tank top on the beach this summer. I don't care about that at all. And every single one of my doctors, I mentioned I'm going through all these tests. Every single one of them looks at me and they're like, holy cow, you're in incredible shape. And the fact that you have these habits and live this lifestyle puts you in a position not only to prevent these things these bad things from happening to you, but to recover much more quickly when they do. And like, you know, the doctor before my surgery looked at me and he was like, you're going to bounce back from this in no time. And that first week, it didn't feel like it. 
But now, eight weeks later, I feel as good as I felt in months. And I know I'm going to a better place. Nice. Uh, you mentioned Huberman Labs. I, I, I'm wondering if you follow the, I can't remember the time frame, but it's like within an hour and a half of waking up, go outside, let sunlight into your eyes. Do you do that every day? Sunlight is a huge part of my routine. I'm always emphasizing it to my kids. If you look at my feed, I take sunrise pictures until I think they're really boring. And I've even had posts where I'm like, some people think sunrise pictures are boring. Maybe the picture is boring, but the real thing isn't. Mm. I get out, I, my dogs and I, we greet the sun every single day. And now I'm blessed because my family and I go out and we set the sun every single day. And I'll like, I'll just go outside and let the sunlight get in my eyes. I've stopped wearing sunglasses unless I'm driving. Yeah. This is, you know, yes, I do that. Awesome. Jeffrey, I, before we wrap up, I, I love to ask people about books. You've already mentioned a few like Atomic Habits. Um, what are some other books that have really influenced you in your journey? Wow. Um, that's a really cool question. Uh, Atomic Habits was a big one. A lot of the times I book the books that I read sort of validate things or they make things clear to me that I already knew. They just articulate them in really concise ways. This is the psychology of money is one of those books. Um, but Atomic Habits, Hidden Potential by Adam Grant. I really got a lot out of that book. Also, uh, Hidden Potential emphasizes resilience a lot. Um, the book Ikigai, and people say Ikigai, Ikigai. The book Ikigai was a big influence on me. The book Outlived or Outlive by Dr. Peter Atia. I've never read this book, but I heard Peter Atia go on Huberman's podcast. And that was like when I heard Atia go on Huberman's podcast, that when I was that was when I was like, wait a minute, I've been doing this stuff and didn't know it. Th these guys just sort of crystallized this thing. And there was another one. And I can't, I, I have this app called Blinkist. Have you ever heard of Blinkist? Yeah, I have. I, I'm going to be getting rid of Blinkist, but I blinked this book. I think it was called Superhuman. And it was about longevity. There's a lot of great longevity books. I think Superhuman was one where I, in reading that, it helped me sort of develop the system that I use with, with mindset, with, with health, mindset, and purpose being the main pillars of the system and then the subdomains of each being like, I'm, like I concentrate on these things. It's funny, Artie, because, I, and if I could think of more books, like I'm, I'm now I'm a little scattered. We've been doing this for a while, but th th those are, those are really influential books for me. I also love to read fiction. I get a lot out of it and I'm writing some works of fiction for my kids now. Nice. Um, and that's challenging and hard. I, like, I'm always looking for a new book to read. The, the best book that I haven't read, I think, is it's, it's the Marcus Aurelius book. Meditations. It's the one everybody talks about. I, meditations, like, I think. Meditations. That, that, yeah. That's one I have to read that I haven't read. And another one that I've read in the last year that influenced me a lot was The Almanac of Naval Ravikant. That was another one where, you know, I read it and was like, ah. It opened my eyes a lot. Yeah, I'm reading that one right now. It's a good book. I, I love it. I, like, I, I, I really like books that present many ideas in really concise fashion. Um, there was one called The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. I love Ryan Holiday's work. The Obstacle is the Way. Hmm. So, nice. I, somewhere, like, I used to keep these. Oh, look. I used to keep these books on my desk so I could show them to people. Like. The obstacle is the way. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to give you a chance to tell listeners where they can find you on X or in anything, signing up for your newsletter, anything else you want to share. Yes. You can find me on X at Jeff Banks with one F. Jeff Banks is not an uncommon name, apparently. So I had to go with one F, but it works. It's kind of cool. Um, there, there are a couple of things that I would encourage people to click on in my bio if you're interested in learning more about what I do or connecting with me personally. My DMs are open. I love meeting new people. 
and I love making connections with people. My newsletter is called the Longevity Chronicles. It's on Beehive. So it's longevitychronicles.beehive.com. It's in my bio on X and it's a weekly newsletter. I'm not cluttering up your inbox. I'm not selling anything on it right now. It's just me talking about the pillars and the subdomains of my system. And what I do is I try to relate common problems that people have with solutions that I've developed. So it's very, you know, it's very much a lot of personal observations and stuff like this and kind of fun. You can learn about longevity and about me and my ebook fundamentals of longevity is available at my buy me a coffee site. You can find the link in my bio on X. It's a really nice little ebook that outlines my longevity system. And it's got really pretty images. The language is really concise. I'm really proud of it. And I'm, what, I, what my plan is, is to develop more ebooks that highlight different areas of the domains and subdomains of the system. So you can look forward to that from me. Awesome. Jeffrey, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Artie, it really has been a pleasure talking with you. And I look forward to more encounters with you out in the domain of X and elsewhere. If, you know, for everyone listening to this, you're part of Artie's audience, but I can say that Artie is definitely one of the most interesting and thought provoking people that I've encountered in my X journey so far. And I can't wait to join more of your spaces and participate in them. Awesome. Thanks, Jeffrey. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple. It goes a long way in helping the podcast grow and reach more listeners. You can also like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you want to support the show, you can go to fractalzoo.net where I have unique fractal-inspired clothing. Each purchase goes directly toward helping the podcast grow. I'll also leave my Amazon affiliate link in the description. You can click on that before making an Amazon purchase and a small commission may go to the podcast. I love to connect with my audience. So find me on Twitter or X at RDTM Podcast. That's A-R-T-I-E-T-M Podcast. Or you can find me on Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for listening today. That's it for this one. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.